Hello, my name is uh, Matthew Mazzara, and I am an artist that works with uh, communities and their public spaces. I was going to show um, five different works that I've done in the United States over the last uh, 10 plus years, actually, um, but snippets of them, so we're not going to get into them all fully. But um, we'll start with that. One project I did, this one was called the bicycle, and this happened in Boston uh, about 10 years ago, and it focused on public transportation. We conceptualized the city as a living organism, and we said, ah, just like the leaf has the veins that brings nutrients or information to different parts of the leaf, we thought about neighborhoods in the public transportation system. Neighborhoods, they get more access to public uh, transportation, can get to the places they want quicker, and you know, communities that have less access to public transportation sometimes have a harder time. Um, in some ways, uh, it could t determine the health of a community. And that's when it gets into real estate values and um, you know, environmental racism. They put the stuff that nobody wants in their neighborhoods. So we started this project with a, a website. This was back in the day. Um, so it doesn't look that good. But back then, it was actually <laughs> legitimate. It could work. Um, and then. Uh, yeah, no social media at the time, and, but still we gained about 65 different volunteers and they were from pastry chefs to horn players to bike nuts to MIT professors. All under this umbrella, let's get together and we'll make a project. So someone donated us a van, someone gave us a uh, location to build in, and we got together and we started building. Uh, people donated bicycles. This is actually from Harvard that uh, Harvard throws out some bed frames and stuff. So we used any kind of recycled material we could. Show a little video. Stop I'm Heather Clark, and I'm partners with Matthew Mazzotto on this project. We're the founding artists, and there's been a group of over 50 people that have helped make the project happen. So we made a 15-person pedal-powered vehicle. We call it the bicycle. It's like a bus. Has no motor, so everybody pedals. <laughs> this project is all made out of recycled materials. Transportation can be something that really can be a disengaging aspect that can actually destroy neighborhoods and destroy communities, or it can be the thing that actually ties people together. And transportation is being a litmus test of what's happening in your community. We opened it up because we had absolutely no idea how to build a bicycle, and so we involved over 50 volunteers. What we saw is that the bicycle brings people together. It kind of crosses boundaries. You ever heard this term, top-down planning? where like the city would go, your neighborhood gets a bus or a subway or you get a bike path. It's basically people up top saying your, your community should get this. This is the other way. We took a whole bunch of people from the community and said, let's build something and now it goes where we want to go. Oh my God, huh? Okay. Let's see this. Oh, don't, okay, fine. <laughs> we do that too. Okay. So, yeah, no one knew how to build a bicycle. We all got together, we did that. Um, one of the things was um, the city um, of Boston also got involved in this, and that's Mayor Menino, uh, previous mayor. It was the first time that I saw, you know, art and activism and community, public space and local government all come together. I didn't think the city would be interested in critiquing itself, but anyways, we did. I'm gonna go, it's like buffet. We're gonna go over a lot of projects. This is a Park Spark project that uses uh, the technology of a methane digester. It's common in third world countries, also in America, uh, in the West. Um, basically just takes animal waste and cow manure, often, and closes it off into an anaerobic environment. And the microbes in there, the little bugs, they love that environment, and they kind of essentially breathe out methane. Anyways, it becomes a usable gas, and you can burn it. First time I ever saw one was uh, my friend in Vermont showed me this one. He had it in his backyard. Uh, inlet pipe is on the right. Uh, that little bubble is where the gas um, captures, and then it overflows onto the left. So he was dumping in last night's dinner, and he was lighting it. Um, he also works on these bigger ones that are scalable for how many cows you have. You can scale it. And then you can take that energy, burn it, um, and put it back onto the grid. Actually, I should mention one thing. It, I was interested in that this project because it was free energy that I couldn't even believe that you could just get free energy. But also burning methane uh, has an environmental component, so it actually reduces its effect on the environment. They, when I was doing the project, they said methane was like 30 to 70 times as potent as a greenhouse gas. I just realized that I got a video coming up that will tell all you that. 
I don't need to say this. I think I structured this in, in a way. We're here at uh, Pacific Street Park in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and uh, we're going to use the Park Spark project, transforming dog waste into energy to power public art. First thing we'll do is we'll wait until the dog does its business, and then uh, we'll scoop it up in one of these biodegradable bags that's offered by the Park Spark project. Pop it in there. Stir is a little wheel here, and you can spin this thing, and it goes right into the tank. And this mixes up the water and the dog waste inside. Methane is about 30 to 70 times more potent than carbon dioxide, so by burning it, you're actually reducing it um, to just carbon dioxide and water, which is a great thing for the park. Get involved and build a project that uses the energy from the methane. And this has the digester with a little uh, tube coming off of it, powering a kettle for some tea. So it's this free source of energy that can be used in any way the community wants to use it. All right. I'm going to jump right into another video. Um, and I won't give any talk about this because I think it holds everything. This is, a, this is an excerpt from a project. I was invited to do a work in Alabama, so this is what came of it. <laughs> Open House is a unique event space. It is a collaboration with the people of York, Alabama to transform a blighted property in York's downtown into a new public art project that has the shape of a house but can physically transform into a 100-seat open-air theater free for the public. In January 2011, artist Matthew Mazzara was invited by the Coleman Center for the Arts to organize an artwork with the people of York, Alabama. The Coleman Center is a contemporary arts organization that uses art to foster positive social change and has been bringing creativity and support to the people of York since its founding in 1985. During his initial visit to York, the artist asked people from the community to bring something from their living rooms so that they could recreate a living room outdoors in the middle of the street as a way to provoke discussion about what were on people's minds and to generate ideas about what direction they might go in. From the discussions in this outdoor living room, they identified that York really had a lack of public spaces that are truly open to everyone, and as they listened to each other's stories and experiences of York, this became a common thread. They also identified that the many abandoned houses all over the downtown have been bringing down the look and feel of York for years. From this conversation, they developed a project that uses the materials of an abandoned house, as well as the land it sits on, to build a smaller house on the footprint of the old house. However, this new house has a secret. It physically transforms from the shape of a house into an open-air theater that sees 100 people by having its walls and roof fold down. It's called open house. Open house lives mostly in the form of a house between the main grocery store and the post office, reminding people what was there before. But it opens up when the community wants to enjoy shows, plays, movies, and any other event people can think of that supports community life in York. And when the theater is folded back up into the shape of a house, the property is a public park for anyone to enjoy. I wanted to show uh, that project because that's the first time I actually ever used the outdoor living room as a technique to uh, gain information. So that, you know, putting a living room in public space and inviting community into it and trying to capture the voices of people that usually don't go to the university meeting or the city hall. So try to get some authentic um, aspect of the community. I also work with, with universities in the city when I do these projects. Um, I want to pop into this. I realize I, okay. 
this project, Boulder, Colorado, I got there, and the first thing I realized, they said um, it had the highest density of climate scientists. So the most people studying the, earth, uh, the weather and the climate um, are in Boulder, Colorado. I don't know if that's true or not, that's what they told me. And there's federal, all these federal labs there. So I knew there was research there. Um, second thing is uh, foodie town. If anybody's been to Boulder, Colorado, lots of food. I was actually sitting in a restaurant and they had this thing called fairy bubbles and I asked them what it was. It was some drink with like herbs and a tincture and you had to pray over it and I was, they, they were very advanced with that. So I wanted to um, combine these two things, uh, the research from the scientists and then the, the chefs of this area. So I contacted the chefs or the, the researchers and I said, could you give me a list of all the plants and natural resources that are going to be leaving this area in the next 20 to 40 years due to uh, the changing climate? They gave me that list of all these plants, <clears throat> and then I gave it to these chefs, and they uh, produced some food. And we served it to the public through this table. Actually, this table travels the United States um, serving food from their local areas that are leaving because of climate change. point out this is like a gravity fed system so one chef had produced some soup that's at the top then two jars of kombucha and there was also chocolate fast so I'm gonna jump into the last video and then I might I'll close what happens when a small town in Nebraska dealing with the changing face of rural America invites an artist to take a deeper look into their untapped resources The Storefront Theater is a unique event space that transforms Main Street into an outdoor theater. It is a collaboration with the people of Lyons, Nebraska, and the surrounding towns to seamlessly weave art into their downtown. The project begins when the Center for Rural Affairs, a local nonprofit focused on strengthening rural communities, small businesses, and family farms, invites artist Matthew Mazzara to organize an art project with the people of Lyons. <laughs> The artist first begins the project by asking people from the community to join him in a living room placed on Main Street as a way to provoke discussion and capture stories and ideas from people that might not feel they have anything to contribute to an artwork. During those Main Street discussions, many community members reveal fond memories of a once thriving downtown and express a strong desire to see the downtown become the center of community life once again. One local person points out that one of the buildings is only a storefront, a wall with no building behind it just an empty lot. Upon investigation, it turns out that this location is owned by the City of Lyons and with its support becomes the site of the art project. What has happened in Lyons has happened all across the country. Small town Main Street USA has suffered as goods, services, entertainment and the jobs that go with them moved away. Buildings that once housed bowling alleys, barbershops, bars, theaters and restaurants have closed their doors. 
As rural downtowns lie fallow, what will become of these carefully constructed commercial hubs of the past? That's history for you. That uh, you know, the, they haven't figured out what to do with them all. You know, uh, um, somebody has to come up with an idea. You know. After the storefront was selected as the site of the project, two residents of Lyons came forward to bring their diverse and highly skilled talents to the project, shaping the final design and bringing many other members of the community into the final work of art. Using two hydraulic pump arms, false storefront, and metal awning, they can be lowered onto the street to form the support structure of the seating. A screen is pulled in when the theater is open. However, both the seats and the screen disappear between events, giving the impression that there is nothing unusual about this downtown. Only word of mouth informs others about Lyon's secret theater. Before the retractable storefront wall is even conceived, Another Lions resident, who says he doesn't mind being called eccentric, enters the story. Oh. Bill Hedges, a local mail carrier, recently retired and decided to take up his lifelong passion of movie making. When Bill first hears of the project, he expresses interest and gives a tour of his basement that includes a personal movie theater, a recreation of a 1950s coffee shop that features a working jukebox, and a full replica of the interior of the spaceship from the 1960s TV show, Lost in Space. So you just flip the appropriate switches, and it appears for you. Inertial guidance system destroy. I'm Bill Hedges, and I've always been a fan of Lost in Space. Bill's passion for the TV show does not end with what he created in his basement. He also recently bought one of the empty storefronts downtown, and turned it into a movie set depicting the spaceship's landing site. While building his movie set, Bill also starts to amass a collection of video making equipment and explains his idea to write and shoot original science fiction movies and cast his cat as the main actor since he decided that human actors would be too costly and unpredictable in their scheduling. When asked, Bill is more than happy to write and shoot a movie called Decades for the project that has downtown lions as its focus. The premise of the 45-minute movie is to explore the history of the downtown from the founding of Lyons to the present day as a way to see where the town has been and where it's going. After it's announced that Bill will shoot his movie, he sets a schedule for shooting each decade. People from Lyons and the surrounding community show up as actors dressed in costumes and with vintage cars that match the time period. Right here, she is uh, you know, going to be an extra, but she's also going to direct the extras. He stages scenes such as the old telephone switchboard operator, conversations in the coffee shop, and the elaborate montage of Saturday nights on Main Street in the 1960s. Another Lions native who now works in the movie industry hears about the project and comes back to town with his drone to help shoot lions from above. On a warm night in November, the main street of Lions, which is usually empty after dark, fills with people from the community and beyond for the opening of the storefront theater and the debut of the movie Decades. As parents, grandparents, and children of all ages gather on Main Street to witness something experimental in their own downtown, they sit side by side to see themselves, their neighbors, and the town they call home reflected so clearly back to them. The storefront theater taps directly into the opportunity that exists in rural towns across America to creatively repurpose and reprogram downtown buildings that once were the backbone of community life into new sites of experience, interaction, and dialogue. The message on this night is simple. People that sit together can dream together.
and what's next? <laughs> so yeah, I have a bunch of works, and you can find most of them on my website. Um, however, um, we have been using this outdoor living room as a technique to get into communities. Um, and sometimes we're doing an interesting job from the city wants to know what the communities are up to, but sometimes we're capturing a side of it they're, they're not seeing, so it's bringing some excitement. I'm in a position now where some of these communities um, are presenting me problems that are larger than I've ever dealt with before, and I don't know if the people that are bringing me in are placing me in heavier duty your situations or if we're figuring out how to get deeper or whatever, but um, that's the next question for me. How do we keep on with this immersive, you know, what's it called, participatory action research I learned the other day. Um, <laughs> anyways, it's just how do we get people to talk about their community in a way that actually ends up being something. And so uh, I'm working with a number of communities now and uh, yeah, things like food desert, um, unemployment, you know, violence. Uh, what can we do? Um, that one, this is Louisville. Uh, this is Saudi Arabia. We did it here. This is about actually class in some ways. But um, I'll end it with that. That's the end of mine. <laughs> <laughs>